has been some pretty significant changes in what I do. Uh, it's less about teaching and a lot more about trying to make our organization, which is the university, run quite a bit better. So since I have moved into this role just within the past uh, five years, I have even, I've gotten an even more in-depth look at what data means in terms of how things run and how things um, look. Um, and helping people like my dean and the provost make appropriate decisions in terms of what classes we should offer, how many classes we should offer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, I know that my topic is a little bit different than technology, but the goal in many ways I think is really the same. Um, how to take information and make things work better for everybody, right? So I wanna talk a little bit about data and hopefully give you some good ideas uh, to get started on how to work with data. If you're currently working with data, then how to help others work with data. Um, and of course, in the short amount of time that we have here, I'm not gonna give you a crash, crash course in data analytics or anything like that, but in some ways that is the easier part. Um, it's getting to that point, I think for many of us where you're ready to learn, uh, that can be a little bit tricky. So I wanna start, and actually I'm gonna stop share for a second. I'm gonna pull something else up because I want to start by asking you a quick question. And this is gonna require a little bit of technology. So you can do this with either your phone or your computer. And if you can log on, open up a web browser and log on to menti.com and it will ask you for a code. Go ahead and put in this code, 67439698. And it's up at the top of the, the slide there. And I want you to just type in one word answers. And you can type up to three. What do you think of when you think of data analysis. Excel, I'm assuming that's a spreadsheet, all right. And this is what we call a word cloud. So as people say similar words, those words get larger, if any of you are not familiar with a word cloud. But I love using these because in real time, we can see what people are actually saying about the words that we're using. Overwhelming, information, master, Pictures, oh, I like that. Actually, I really like that, that one about pictures. Information, knowledge, logistic regression. Wow, somebody actually has taken a pretty advanced statistics class. Um, problem solving, good. Demographics, complicated. Trends, revealing patterns, boring. That's one of my favorite ones, a story. I also really like that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Headache, great. So it seems like a lot of the, the uh, words that people are looking at are, are kind of fairly dry words, trends, information, decisions. And we see some that are kind of negative too, right? Time consuming, boring, um, revealing patterns. Some of them are really positive ones, right? So uh, visualization, table, some of them aren't really, um, are kind of neutral. I like the idea of, um, oops. I like the idea of uh, looking at all of those different um, ways that we think about data, in part because it lets me know that the audience is a little bit diverse in terms of their maybe their knowledge with data. Whoops. All right. Don't you hate it when your PowerPoint jumps around on you? I know. That's right. So I'm just going to leave it there a little bit um, because it seems to not be. So not I'm going to talk a little bit about my own journey with data, uh, which also has had some positive things, some neutral things, and I would say maybe some negative things. Um, many of you talked a little bit about the usefulness of data, and that's true. Um, and some of you had some negative ideas about it. So I never really was super wowed about math. 
Um, but I was okay at it. It wasn't really my favorite thing to do. I got by just fine. Um, and when I went to college, I had to take a statistics course. So I kind of found myself then in a little bit of a weird place. So even though I felt like I was okay with math, I was decent at math. When I took the statistics course, it was kind of like I was on a really unfamiliar road. So I, I grew up on a farm. Uh, I grew up in a rural area of Nebraska. And the best analogy I can think of with this was, um, I've, been, I've lived in Omaha for the past 25 years. So when I go back home to that farm, I drive on gravel roads. And I'm a pretty competent driver. I feel like I do okay. Um, but when I get on those gravel roads, it's a little bit tense. I feel like I'm in a little bit unfamiliar territory. Now, every great once in a while, I have found myself on what we call a minimum maintenance road. And if any of you are from rural areas, you will be familiar with the term minimum maintenance road. Oftentimes these are roads that have huge potholes in them. It takes you forever to get anywhere on them. That's how I felt when I got into the statistics course because this was not just something that I felt like I was a little bit uncomfortable with. It felt like something that I didn't really know where I was. And it made me really nervous. And not only that, I felt like I couldn't really even remember the things that I knew I was good at. So even though I knew that I was okay at math, somehow that I kind of even froze up and didn't really have an idea about how to utilize that as well. So some of the thoughts running through my mind at that time where this kind of looks unfamiliar, this looks like I've seen something that other people can do, maybe not me, maybe I'll just get in other people's way if I attempt this. So let's just kind of stick it out. And then of course, um, as a, as for myself, the, the question I have to ask myself when I'm ever in unfamiliar territory, am I wearing the right shoes? Which for me was a resounding no the first time that I took that um, statistical analysis class. Um, similar to the kind of panic almost that I found on that gravel road, it was a little bit less dramatic, but I was getting to the point where I was clearly asking the wrong questions. And I realized that I was a little bit outside of my element. So after I took this class for me, I would have been happy to just say, okay, look, you know what? I needed that for my degree. I'm going to walk away and I will never, ever again, look at something like statistics or any sort of analysis. However, I wanted to go to graduate school um, and I knew that I would have to take statistics. And more importantly, I knew that I was going to be working with community organizations. So one very important part of my journey was that after I graduated, with my um, bachelor's degree, I worked for some good organizations. And through that work, I found myself really desiring to do good things for those organizations. Um, so I really had a strong distaste for what at the time I knew was data analysis, um, but I also knew that it was something that I was going to have to actually learn, not just get through, but learn. So I took a step back and at the time enrolled in two undergraduate courses, which were uh, research methods and statistical analysis. Um, but this time it wasn't for a grade. It wasn't to get through, it wasn't to get a diploma. In fact, these weren't counting towards anything for me. It was for me to actually learn. And to my surprise, when I went into these classes and took them, it started to make a lot of sense. In fact, it seemed more like logic to me. Um, and I will also say that working those different places prior to taking this course actually put me in a mindset where that data meant something. It was concrete. I had been in an environment where the data that I had been looking at before, which was um, didn't really represent anything to me, all of a sudden I knew that it did represent something and I was much more prepared for it. The road still looked the same, but this time I felt like I had a couple different pairs of shoes packed. So I wanna do a really quick quiz, some interactive time here. Quick yes or no, not sure, cool. And hopefully Gina is able like to run you. that for me. Is that right? Yes, yes ma'am. All right. Yes ma'am, there we go. Great. 
First one, would you say you engage in data analysis on your job? We're going to define what I think data analysis is, but for, for your own definition, would you say that you engage in data analysis on your job? Yes or no? And I do have all three of these questions in the same poll. And I'll share the results of all of these at the same time then. So if you want to go ahead and also answer the question of would you feel comfortable doing a project with a data set? Would you describe yourself skilled in data analysis? So it looks like we've got 31, 33, 35. They're ramping up quickly. So I can close out the poll then in five, four, three, two, one. We'll end polling and share results. All right. So 88% of you feel like you engage in data analysis. Awesome. 79% of you feel like you're comfortable doing a project and only 40% of you would say that you are skilled. Does anybody want to unmute themselves and give me some examples as to why you might say you do it but you don't feel skilled at it? I can offer my perspective. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, you know, we make a lot of decisions through the day and I think we probably don't even think about how much data we use to make those decisions. Um, so I realize I use data on a daily basis, but when I'm around like my data scientists, and I see how they use the data and build predictive models and machine learning and all of that stuff. I'm like, yeah, I, I can't hold a candle to that. So that's why I feel like I'm not, um, it, I don't excel in it or whatever that last question was. Gotcha. That's interesting because it, given your own devices or actually probably compared to 90% of the population, you would really be skilled, right? but it's just because you happen to be working around people who are in your estimation, more skilled than you. Or Anyone super else? Smart. <laughs> yeah, super smart. I, I really like what Robin said because she, she acknowledges that she is using data analysis, she's doing data analysis, but it sounded like the things you were mentioning were technology, maybe layers of technology or tools to analyze data. And I, I definitely am not familiar with all of the tools and I'm not an expert with all of the, the applications that are available to analyze data, but I can put a whole bunch of stuff in a spreadsheet and look for patterns. And to me, that's data analysis, I, you know, find, to find the story in the numbers. So I feel skilled in that aspect, but definitely not in all of the new uh, yeah. tech applications that are available. Great. Well, I will, uh, that's a great launch into this idea of what is data and what is data analysis exactly? Um, because in fact, sometimes we think of what we're doing as data analysis and it probably is, um, but that there's a lot of different forms that that can take. So in a nutshell, data is information. What's interesting to me is that both data can, data can be both quantitative and qualitative. It's maybe not, interesting so much as there's sort of a perception that data is only quantitative, um, that it's very spreadsheet, um, or that it's very predictive model oriented, or that one needs to learn, you know, calculus, advanced calculus to be able to do data analysis, okay? Um, and this idea of qualitative and quantitative information, they're not really as distinct as we might think. Um, so when we say data analysis, again, most of the time we think of a spreadsheet, right? Or a regression analysis or a logistic um, analysis, logistic regression analysis, or um, some sort of a time trial analysis, right? Something that actually puts numbers into some sort of uh, calculation and spits out information. Um, but it can also be something like a personnel file. You may have heard this distinction between you know, quantitative and qualitative data, and you think that quantita quantitative is the one that involves numbers and qualitative is the one that doesn't, it involves words. But again, they're not really as distinct as we might think. And it's easy to see once you start getting into what data is, um, that 
quantitative data is really in some ways and in some instances, an organized repackaging of qualitative data. So here's what I mean. The idea, for instance, of a personnel file being data sets, even though most personnel files don't have a lot of numbers in them and very few might even have spreadsheets. Um, so let's say that a team member, let's call him Joe, has in his personnel file a decent amount of information, which we would call data, including the number of times he's called in sick, seven times this past year. You might also have something like his survey ranking with customers that he talks to, say he averages 6.43 out of 10 um, for his customer ranking, survey rankings. And you might have a few notes from colleagues about his general behavior. One kudo for helping out another team and one complaint about the fact that his breaks were too long. So here is a situation where he, we have what we would call a data set. We have a mix of quantitative and qualitative information. Um, and it's important to keep in mind all of this data when we're thinking about that information to make a decision. So whether to give Joe a raise or a promotion or whether to not give him a promotion or to write him up or to let him go, right? Um, so how do we analyze data like this? Well, for one, we contextualize this with additional data. So Joe's survey ranking, for instance, among customers doesn't mean a whole lot unless we actually get to compare that with the average survey ranking, say in Joe's unit or in the company. Um, a spreadsheet that gives us the mean average, uh, the mean number for customer satisfaction survey across the company or division is a great piece of generalized quantitative information that can help us put Joe's scores into context. What about things like times absent? You could also probably use a quantitative context for that, that might help here, which is basically comparing it to others but also comparing to himself in previous years. So if you look at something like times absent or um, personnel files, we have what we would call a comparative methodology. So we would compare it to other employees across the institution, but we might also compare it to that same person across time. So a longitudinal format versus um, um, one that's not, uh, yeah, the one that's not. So this, piece of information may also be supplemented with what we would call qualitative context. So Joe may have been sick so many times because of a unique and limited illness, or maybe because he wasn't given a necessary chair at work that threw out his back. So info like this can be pretty crit critically important to supplement quantitative data. And in most places, a note or qualification placed in individual's personnel files might account for this. So for me, when we think about data sets and we think about what data is, um, it's really critical and important to note that uh, quantitative and qualitative data um, are, can be equal, equally crucial and that data analysts aren't necessarily only working with numbers nor should they only work with numbers. So for me, the relationship uh, between quantitative and qualitative data has make me, made me a better researcher. So one of my research areas is crime mapping. I do spatial analysis over large areas and then look at patterns. So my dissertation looked at whether the locations of bars or pubs affected the number of felonious assaults in the surrounding area. It was a huge, huge amount of information. Um, 7,600 blocks, 242 different establishments, about 2,800 assaults over a three-year period of time. And I did a lot of um, statistical analysis and found that one could expect about a 40%, about 40% more reports of assault in the places around bars than for those where no liquor serving establishments existed. On the one hand, that kind of specific information is pretty cool. Um, and it's super helpful to agencies like law enforcement who are trying to figure out their patrol, right? On the other, it's not really a complete picture. So here's why. The hundreds of different establishments that I counted as bars were obtained because they had a particular kind of liquor license to be liquor that was to be consumed on their premises. So it doesn't take too long to realize that Bob's Biker Bar had the exact same liquor license as Chuck E. Cheese. 
Well, anyone who's been to those two different establishments knows that they're actually very different. And we probably can expect different results, especially in terms of felonious assaults. In addition, the thousands of assaults were obtained from the police department. That means that somebody reported those assaults. But if no one reported it, at least in my data set, it didn't happen. So a specific statement like the 40% is great, but we have to make sure that that data analysis needs to be contextualized with other information. Now, don't get me wrong. I really love quantitative analysis, um, even though I didn't for quite some time. Um, by the way, the end of my personal story is that I went back and finally got into graduate school and I took my first statistics course after having I retaken two undergraduate courses. And I loved it so much that I ended up taking three additional advanced statistical analysis courses. And for me, that's how I did a completely quantitative um, dissertation it was because I was able to feel really comfortable with that data um, and really comfortable manipulating it and making cool statements. But my journey didn't end there because I quickly followed it up with, well, wait a minute, now that I know it and now that I feel comfortable with it, I also know that that's not the end of the story. So again, I love quantitative um, data analysis. I think it's re a really, really useful tool that can help us make sense of the world and it can help us make sense of organizations. Um, I like it because it in particular gives us a common language to use. And one of the things that helped me a lot was thinking about numbers, not just as something that only smart people can manipulate in, in cool ways, but that it's a common language that we can all use. So everybody knows, for instance, that five is larger than three, but everybody might not know whether annoying is worse than frustrating, right? Um, in its most basic sense, it helps us to paint a picture of reality that everybody can see with the same eyes. So trying to do something as basic as describe a group of people, for instance, uh, can be really difficult unless you do it in a systematic way. And if you do it in a systematic way, then you can get a general idea of what those people look like. So the group was half, half men and half women. Their average height was five foot eight. 75% of them had college degrees. The median ACT score was a 26. Um, now, given that information is really quantitative analysis, we don't know that much information about a particular person, but we can start for get, to get a feel for what that group looks like as a whole. Um, so quantitative analysis, what we tend to call data analysis, is really looking at a few common things across a large number of, of units, whether that's people or uh, programs, et cetera. And the neat thing is that we can get pretty good at predicting. Um, uh, if we, if we, we utilize it enough, um, we can do a, very, uh, a lot of different things with it. Not just descriptive, right? But applying those descriptives to a larger group, uh, what we call inferential, and then actually using that information to plan. So something like um, talking about the expectation that there would be 40% more assaults um, with every additional liquor license on a particular block. You can actually get to the point, some of you talked about this earlier, that you could do some predictive modeling about what we really can expect. Um, but again, there's some drawbacks, right? There's error and there's some normal error or random error um, in the sense that we don't always um, that uh, every time we use mathematics, we have some sort of random error, sampling error. But in addition to that is the fact that like Joe's personnel file, we can't know everything to contextualize the information that we have. I love it when I hear something like uh, somebody saying numbers don't lie, which is true, unless it's a lie of omission. So when we talk about data analysis, the reality is um, that it's great. In fact, it's awesome. Um, but we also have to make sure that those people who are not our data people or who are less data people or less um, skilled at uh, that quantitative analysis actually get in and help us spur ideas about what we're doing with that data. Okay, so I wanna take another really quick poll. 
someone's using quantitative data to make some important decisions about your workplace. And when I mean important, I say things like restructuring, team configuration, et cetera. How do you feel about participating in this effort? So I've got the poll pulled up so you can see your different options on there. So you really wanna be at the table, feel good about participating. You might wanna be in the room and might add some input, but would be actively involved. Wait until it's all done probably wouldn't say anything or really um, would not participate in it. This looks like we've already got over 30 people in there. I'm gonna Perfect. close it down in five, four, three, two, one, and the polling and let me share those results. And 63%, as you can see, right there at the table and feel good about participating, which is awesome. A couple of you, or about a third, I can understand, but maybe wouldn't be as actively involved. And then a lower percentage, wait until it's done and then look it over, or wouldn't participate at all. So while you're doing that, I want you to just do a quick popcorn style typing those answers into the chat. For those of you who hesitated about participating, if, you're, um, if you'd like to say, why would you hesitate? Why weren't you at the very top um, participating? And those of you who felt really comfortable saying, I would be right there, why is it that you feel, feel um, comfortable? It's just a couple of quick answers. So we'll give people a minute to get their keyboards ready, put some thoughts in there as to why you'd feel, feel good about being at the table. So we have one person that says, I, well, I would participate because I'd be very curious. Yeah. And I think at looking about at how things can change for the better is exciting. would rather be involved and add perspective. The more input, the better the decision. Some good insights in here, let me. Now you, got, now you, now you guys have warmed up your keyboards, you're typing right. faster than I can read. I love the idea of saying um, anything that contributes to learning is always beneficial to grow. And I really like the idea of saying, the more people, the better. Um, I would be curious to, and you can talk about this when we go into small groups, which we will in um, not too much time. Somebody said there's too much time involved. Um, but I love the idea of feeling as though uh, you can add and should add to that conversation. Want a chance to give my input, absolutely. So there's a comment on here on half the battle of collecting data is setting up valid unbiased surveying collection met method. That's an a lot of overhead. So some comments there. And then someone else wanted to know about the parameters of the data. What decisions did they make? Yeah, absolutely. So there's where we kind of get into this idea that quantitative data, quantitative data must be informed by qualitative decisions, um, even if it's not completely qualitative data that's informing it. Um, it's I've run a lot of data with um, crummy data. And in fact, I did an entire analysis one time where I had my variables completely mixed up and my results didn't mean anything, but I had some information. So the idea of sort of garbage in, garbage out, um, it has to be informed. And so I really love the idea of saying, yes, let's jump in um, and make sure that people understand the parameters of the data that we're looking at. Um, so befriending, befriending data, no matter what your experience or role. Um, find out the, if you're not involved in analysis in your organization, find out the best way to ask or learn about what kind of data is being used, what are the parameters of the data that are being input, um, and where that comes from. Or if you're a data person and you're doing it, try and have a conversation with those who are not. 
because they actually may have very good perspectives to give you in terms of whether or not the data that you're looking at is appropriate or whether you need to look for more. I do think that it's, you know, there's a, um, um, a desire to sort of keep ourselves invaluable um, with the jobs that we have. But the reality is the best way to help any organization is to make sure that we've got the perspectives of everybody around us. And cross-communication, especially when we talk about something like data analysis, to make decisions is critical. There have been stories about organizations that have made huge decisions about data and because they didn't check with other people in their organizations or they didn't do their due diligence, those decisions were really problematic. I don't know if any of you are old, old enough to remember the new Coke, but that was done with really problematic data. <laughs> and data needs context. Ask what the numbers mean. How are they obtained? Do they seem accurate? Are there things missing? Are there areas that are not represented? Are there people or voices that need to be at the table who aren't at the table because they don't know about data analysis? So Becky, would it be, or sorry, Rebecca, <laughs> there I go, go again ahead, to yeah. the old name. Um, so would it be fair to say like, in, from my perspective on different things where I've been in meetings where I see it really valuable is even if people aren't necessarily confident in doing the data analysis, the perspective that, can, that they can bring by understanding the context or asking questions to make sure the context there is invaluable. So find your chair at the table is what, what I would say. Make, make sure you scoot all the way in because the context that you can add is, and then you'll learn something along the way as well. Absolutely. And I would also say if you're at the table, because I think we've got a lot of folks in this group that are at that table, invite other people in. Be critical of the data that you're analyzing. Be critical of what you're actually putting into your spreadsheets or your programs, um, because sometimes that data might need some context or it might need some additional uh, measures um, or it might be great. Right. And the, the, the worst thing that can happen is that you explain how things are done to people that uh, you work with to make it a better a better place for everyone. I think that context is one of the most important parts of it comparatively, because even now with all the, the COVID stuff, and we've been dealing with this for a year now, and sometimes I, you know, I don't pay attention to it every day. So, you know, it might be a week or two or more, and all of a sudden I'm hearing these new numbers, but they don't tell me what it was a week ago or a month ago or a year ago. So I have no idea whether it's up, down, sideways or whatever. So, you know, I, I think people really, you know, putting things into context always is, is it one of the most important parts of relaying that information? Absolutely. So it was interesting that you, um, the first time I looked at the Douglas County COVID board dashboard, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, people over people and test over test. What does that mean? And exactly how are those two things distinct? And so digging into those questions about, well, why is this data point very different than this one? When it looks like we're measuring the same things digging into what they actually mean when they do those tests is pretty important. Yeah, great point. Any other thoughts or questions before we go into a little bit of small group discussion? I think folks are excited for their small groups. All right. Oh, there is a question that came in. How do you recommend avoiding setting up data projects that simply reinforce, oh, good question, what the organization thinks it knows? So somebody, yeah, somebody's is, got, a, got a bias there towards how do, we, how do we prove that I'm right? Absolutely. So one of the things that, um, you know, again, that I use a new Coke example, but there's hundreds of other examples of that very thing people sort of already having the outcome in mind and then really understanding how they can look at the analysis to, to, to get that, that very outcome. Um, in terms of how you combat that um, in your own organization, I would just say, start asking questions. Where did this data come from? How do we get this data? And the more people you get involved in talking about that and asking questions, the more likely it is um, that somebody at some point in time is going to say, well, wait a minute, maybe we should rethink this. Maybe we should rethink this. 
So especially those individuals that are running the very complex um, predictive models, um, and that maybe you don't see very often, or maybe aren't in your group, or maybe go talk with them. Because more than likely, they're the ones that might be able to make a difference, especially if they're the ones running that analysis. And to say, you know, tell me a little bit about where this data comes from and what you think of the validity of this data or what you think of the reliability of the data that you're using. I don't, I don't need to know about all the intricacies of your spreadsheet or your models, but what I just want to know is, do you think this is good data? Do you think this is good information? Do you think it's accurate? Can we make it better? And there I think is where you start opening up that conversation because every single organization that I've been at, um, including Creighton where I'm at right now, has this idea that they think that they know what they're going to find. And sometimes we, we have a joke around here that we call it ready, shoot, aim. Like we're, we're already shooting before we're aiming, before we really know what we're looking at. And that can be really problematic because um, A, it doesn't take into account the, that you may find something different. Um, and B, oftentimes that's a process that actually doesn't even involve everyone. Um, so I would say, keep asking questions and keep pushing to get some public information about where that data comes from. The other thing that I would just add to that is asking the question of if, if the decision is made, is there value in doing this project? If the outcome will not impact this project, then why are we, <laughs> why do the research? And I, I mean that a little bit tongue in cheek, but yeah. if, if there's not value in doing this, if this isn't going to sway any opinions, then are we spending our time on the right thing? Right. Then why, why, uh, yeah create a justification for something that's a... If you already know you're going to do it. <laughs> for sure. So I think that the next plan that we had was to go into some small breakout rooms. And so this is just something that we'll do in Zoom where I will automatically um, assign you into some smaller breakout rooms. There'll be five to six people in each room. would love for you to take just a little bit of time to get to know each other.